So shalom, everybody. Very happy to be here at the Amuna Center in, uh, I guess it's the heart of Yerushalayim, something like that. Would you say this is the heart of Yerushalayim? Anywhere the Amuna Center is, is at the heart of Yerushalayim, the heart of Eretz Yisrael. Uh, we are here today on Tuesday, the 10th of August, which is also the 5th of Av. We're just a few days from the fast day of Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of Av. And today, the 5th of Av happens to be the yard site, the, um, commemorating the date of death, the date of passing of the Ari Zal, the Ari, uh, who was known as uh, the Ari because of the acronym of the words either Adonenu Rabbeinu Yitzchak, our master, Rabbi Yitzchak, last name Luria, or some say last name, last name is Ashkenazi. Uh, some say that Ari is an acronym for the words Elohi, Rabbeinu Yitzchak, our holy one, our godly, our divine, Rabbeinu Yitzchak. He lived from 1534 till 1572, the holy Ari, and uh, was uh, the main Kabbalist in Tzfat. And uh, you can still go to his kever, you can still go today uh, to his uh, resting place. And uh, interestingly enough, like a few other great sages, he only lived to be the age of 38. Uh, his words, his philosophy, his teachings are studied in depth today. Uh, 500 years after his passing. When I was a rabbi in America, I was in uh, different synagogues for uh, 25 years. And if my words appeared on the Sisterhood Bulletin cover, I was very happy. <laughs> so imagine 500 years later to still, still be quoted and studied um, after only being on this earth physically for 38 years. Uh, I think it's incredible. And it says uh, everything you need to know. Uh, about the Arizal, Zal meaning his name should be for a blessing, and uh, we hope and pray that our studies today in Pirkei Avot, Ethics of the Fathers, and if we have time, perhaps some mothers, uh, will uh, hold us in good stead and will allow his neshama, the soul of the Arizal, to raise even higher and higher. So today we're just looking uh, very briefly uh, at the very beginning of Pirkei Avot, which is the Ethics of the Fathers, uh, you can study Pirkei Avot any time, but traditionally it's often studied between the holiday of Pesach, or right after Pesach, Passover, until we get to the holiday of Rosh Hashanah, the new year. Um, there you'll find about five and a half, six months of study. Pirkei Avot originally was five chapters, and a sixth chapter was added later on. And uh, given the fact that there were six chapters, it fits in very nicely because between right after Pesach, after Passover, and right as we get to the holiday of Shavuot, the holiday of the giving of the Torah, there are exactly six Shabbatot, six Shabbats. And so their sages thought this would be a great idea to study a chapter um, uh, every Shabbat afternoon for those six Shabbat afternoons. And uh, once those six weeks are over, the rabbi suggested we repeat it. You go one through six again, and then one through six again. When you get to three Shabbats before Rosh Hashanah, the custom has become to do chapters one and two three weeks before, chapters three and four two weeks before, chapters five and six uh, one week before, and then of course we hit the holiday of Rosh Hashanah. So that's a little bit about Pirkei Avot in general. The question that a lot of people ask is, why is this called Pirkei Avot, the chapters of the fathers? When we talk about the chapters of the fathers, who are the fathers? Who are the ones that we're talking about? So there are several uh, answers to this question. First of all, we note that in Pirkei Avot, in the Ethics of the Fathers, Chapters of the Fathers, uh, there is no halacha per se. There's no Jewish law that is brought down and codified through these various Mishnayot, these various teachings. What you do find in Pirkei Avot is a lot of musar, a lot of uh, words about ethics, a lot of midot, various characteristics that are positive that we should be emulating and sharpening. In Pirkei Avot, you learn a lot about Derech Eretz, how to be good, kind, sensitive, compassionate, uh, patient, perhaps. And so uh, we see that Pirkei Avot is not going to teach us a lot about halacha, not a lot about ritual law, what you do when, but it's going to give us a very strong and very serious overlay about behavior. How do we behave as serious Jews who are connected to God. 
Ultimately, the hope of Pirkei Avot, what are we supposed to do with all these teachings and with all of these uh, various kinds of ideas and philosophies about behavior? What are we supposed to do with all of that? So it reminds me of a shoe store uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, which was then right across the street from a large all kosher supermarket. And if you wanted to bring in your shoes, not necessarily to get fixed, uh, but to have a little bit of a shine uh, that they do in a very professional way, uh, you brought in these shoes and they would write down on a small piece of paper, this is to buff and polish. <coughs> so a lot of people brought, I did many times, I brought in my shoes just for a buff and a polish. And uh, I think that's a pretty good way of summarizing what the study of Pirkei Avot is supposed to do. It's supposed to help us buff and polish our character and our personality to give it a shine and a luster. So that's what we're going to be finding in the teachings of Pirkei Avot. So why is it called Pirkei Avot? Uh, in the tractate of Masechet Ediot, one of the 60 Sama tractates of the Talmud, uh, there is a saying that says that our great sages all throughout the centuries are, can be called our Avot. They can be called our fathers. And so, being that Pirkei Avot is a compilation of so many teachings and sayings of many of these great sages throughout Jewish history, perhaps that's why it's called Pirkei Avot. It's the chapters of the fathers, the great sages of the Jewish people. Rashi, uh, the great commentator from France, um, has this to say. He says, why is it called Pirkei Avot? Because these teachings are all an echo, not so much of the sages, although the sages are certainly quoted in Pirkei Avot, but the Avot refers to the fact that these are echoes of the teachings of our national Avot, our national fathers. And who are they? They are Moshe, Moses our teacher. They are Yehoshua, Joshua, his assistant, who then became the leader once we entered Eretz Israel. <coughs> who are these Avot? They are the great leaders of the Jewish people, the original biblical leaders of the nation of Israel. And what we learn in the actual Pir Kavot is all an echo. It's an echo of what they taught us um, while they were alive. A commentary called B'nai Yisachar says, who are the Avot, when we refer to Pirkei Avot? He says, we're referring to the teachings of our um, other Avot, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yago. These are who we call the Avot. These are the forefathers of the Jewish people. And the Bnei Yisachar, this commentary says, why would we refer to them as the Avot? Because we have to know that even before God gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, for 26 generations before, there was an underpinning of uh, morality. There was an underpinning of ethical law. And even though we got the Torah 26 generations after Adam and Eve, you shouldn't think that there was no attempt to have any kind of morality within the Jewish people. Uh, where did this come from? It came from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It came from Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. It came from Joseph, and it came from our other great biblical characters that we call our Avot, our forefathers, as well as our Imahot, as well as our foremothers. So even though the Torah was given in the year 2448, you should know that for 25, 26 generations, we had a way of getting the spiritual, ethical genetics before we even got to the Torah at Mount Sinai. There was an under uh, pinning. There was a, an underlay of morality and ethics that was taught even before we got to the divinity of the Torah at Mount Sinai. As a matter of fact, the rabbis have a teaching, and it says, Ma'ase avot siman lebanim. Whatever the forefathers did, their actions and all of their, um, what, whatever they did is a siman lebanim. It's a signpost for their children, meaning we can look through the books of the Torah, and even before the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, we can see ethical teachings being taught for 25 or so generations before. So who are the Avot? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, all of those who came before the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. There's a commentary called the Eitz Avot. How interesting, Pirkei Avot. 
He calls his commentary Eitz Avot, which means the tree in the sense of the forefathers. And he says, why is this called Pirkei Avot, Ethics of the Fathers? It's actually a guide for Avot, fathers, literally, fathers, by extension, mothers. So this commentary says it's called Pirkei Avot because this is really, at the very heart and kernel, is a guide for parents. If parents were to look at the commentary of Pirkei Avot and they were to look in the Mishnah in each and every one of these teachings and internalize these teachings, there's every great possibility that they will turn out to be outstanding, marvelous, Torah-educating, Torah-feeling, not just Jews, but parents. So that's interesting. So if you're a parent, grandparent, great-grandparent, you may want to look at Pirkei Avot in a kind of a different lens. This is now something that we internalize and teach to the future generations. So, before we turn to the uh, actual first Mishnah of Pirkei Avot, uh, a lot of people ask the question, why is Pirkei Avot in a section of the Mishnah, the oral law, called Nezikin? There are six orders of the Mishnah, of the oral law, and this happens to be at the tail end of the third section called Nezikin, which means damages. So a lot of people ask the question, what is Pirkei Avot? A study of ethics, morality, derech eretz, how to be a good, kind, decent, compassionate, sensitive human being. What's that got to do with the laws of damages? And for those who have studied the Mishnah of Nezikin, or if you're familiar with the Daf Yomi, where you learn a page of the Talmud every day, we are now in Baba Kama, a major tractate <coughs> dealing with all kinds of damages. What happens when you damage this? What happens when your ox gores this one? What happens when there's a pit in the middle of the public square? What happens when people fall, when people get bruised, they, they end up in crutches? Who pays for what? So what's, what is this ethical stuff doing at the tail end of a study that deals with damages? So some of the commentaries say, well, here's the connection to damages. Just like I said a few moments ago that if you really look at Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, it's really meant for parents. There are some commentaries who say really what this whole study is for is for judges. It's for lawyers, it's for attorneys, it's for the courts. They can't just rule and gavel everything. They also have to have a sense of ethics and morality. And once a judge and a court and others within the court system have a sense of ethics, morality, sensitivity, compassion, etc., then you can be a very good judge. You can be a very good witness. But again, there are some commentaries who say this whole Pirkei Avot is really meant uh, for judges, it's for courts, how to administer a system of justice. If the rest of the Jewish people get something out of it, great. But at its essence, it's really for the court system. So what is the connection between Pirkei Avot and, and damages? This is for courts, judges, witnesses, etc. Another commentary says, why is this at the end of Nizikin? Why is this ethical stuff all taught at the end of a tractate or the end of a section of the oral law that deals with damages? And there is one commentary who, it really spoke to me. I think this commentary hits it right on the head. And he says, if a person is ritually observant, ritually observant. What does that mean? That means they do the rituals as best as they understand it. Uh, the prayer rituals, the, the kashrut, the kosher laws. Um, they do uh, uh, other holiday laws, Shabbat laws, uh, keeping the laws of family purity. If you have somebody that is an example, an outward example of somebody who does all of these ritual things, but they don't behave with sensitivity. They don't behave with ethics. They don't behave with morality. They are doing damage. That to me, say, it sings. I'm sorry, that, I'm sorry that it does sing for me. Uh, unfortunately, we, we come up with examples of this where we see uh, individuals who look to us like the models of religiosity, uh, etc., uh, and yet their behavior speaks another language. And what happens? Uh, not only they, when they misbehave, not only they do damage to themselves, 
but they unfortunately do damage to the Jewish people. Unfortunately, people tend to judge a system by the people in the system. So if see, people see somebody who's outwardly religious, observant, etc., but they don't behave that way, it does damage, nezek, nezikin, it does damage to themselves, but unfortunately it does damage in a much wider sense, it does damage to the Jewish community. There was a great uh, rabbi, a great leader of Lithuanian Jewry named Reb Chaim Ozer Grzynski. He lived from 1863 to about 1940. Uh, he was a leading posek, which means he was a decisor of Jewish law, a, a guide for Lithuanian Jewry for over 50 years, and he had the following teaching. He said, a yeshiva, a school of higher Jewish learning, without a mashkiach, without somebody who was a spiritual mentor to all of the students in that yeshiva, but that yeshiva had no spiritual mentor and it had no study of Musar, which means if that place of higher Jewish learning had no study of ethics and morality, it was like creating a bor bir shut harabim. It was like creating a pit, an open pit that was covered in the public space. Now, what is he referring to? Well, imagine yourself going in the shuk here in Jerusalem. Imagine wherever you are, imagine yourself going to a public space uh, and you see that there's an area covered where people are walking and somebody has placed either fake grass or some kind of a fabric over a large area that is deep. And you don't know about it because you're just walking and you see a piece of fabric, you see a piece of plywood, but unfortunately the plywood is not good enough to hold people. The fabric is certainly not good enough to hold people. And that is called in our lingo, bor birshutarabim. It's a, it's a hole in the public square. What is gonna happen with a hole in the public square? People are going to fall right in. They're going to injure themselves, they're going to hurt themselves. So this is what Reb Chaim Ozer Grzynski of Blessed Memory, he says that if you have a school of higher learning without a spiritual mentor that is there to teach people not just the law, but also the ethics, the morality, the codes of how to be a, a mensch, how to be a good Jewish human being, you're creating pitfalls for the students. They are not going to be able to do their work in connecting with God, connecting with Hashem in a proper way. Why? Because just to know the laws without being a good, kind, decent, compassionate human being is going to do all kinds of untold damage. Again, not only to the person, but also to the religion itself. So um, now with that, I, I don't know uh, if anybody who's watching today has a peer keya vote. Uh, if you do, you can turn it to uh, chapter one, teaching number one, which is, is what we're going to look at first. Um, and if you don't, I'll read it to you and then, of course, translate. It says, the very beginning, it says, Kol Yisrael yeshlem chelek le'olam haba. All Israel have a share in the world to come. And each and every one of the six chapters begins with this preamble. All Israel has a share in the world to come. And people ask, why does each chapter begin with that? And a very popular answer to that is, is that if this is to be learned on Shabbat afternoon, and that seems to be the most uh, uh, followed kind of a ritual that on Shabbat afternoon people, especially during the summertime, which is mostly when this is studied most seriously from after Pesach to Rosh Hashanah, long Shabbat afternoons, we could be involved in all kinds of stuff that may not be the most spiritual, here is something that anchors us spiritually. So what does that got to do with the preamble, all Israel has a share in the world to come? Some commentaries say the rabbis wanted every Jew to know whether you're far from Jewish practice or very close to Jewish practice, whether you feel like you've connected with God strongly during the week or you feel like you've made no connection whatsoever. Just by the fact that you're a Jew, just by the fact that you're a member of Israel not necessarily the country, but the people, the Jewish people, just the fact that you're a Jew, you already have a share in the world to come. Even if you haven't studied a thing throughout the entire week and this is the first thing you're studying and you feel a, say, a sense of shame or guilt or, oh, I can't believe I haven't studied a darn Jewish thing this entire week, the rabbis wanted you to know 
even if you haven't opened up a book, you haven't given a Jewish thought, you haven't opened up a website of Jewish knowledge, nothing, zero, you still have a share in the world to come. So don't be embarrassed to begin the study of Pirkei Avot. You're, you're in the game. You're a part of the game. Don't feel out of it, feel in it. And perhaps that's why each and every chapter begins with every Jew has a share in the world to come. We don't have time to talk about the fact that Maimonides had a lot to say about this idea that every Jew has a share in the world to come. He said, every Jew? Every Jew has a share in the world to come? What about the ones we just spoke about? The disconnected, disinfected, disaffected. I think that's better than disinfected. The, dis <laughs> the disaffected Jew, the one who's totally not connected, doesn't feel any kind of a cashier, any kind of a bond. So Maimonides said, I don't believe that every Jew has a share in the world to come. The only Jews that have a share in the world to come are the ones that believe in the following 13 principles. And that's how we got the 13 principles of faith. And that's how we got a prayer called Yigdal. Yigdal, la da 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 Yigdal is based on Maimonides' 13 principles of faith. And he said that we have no more time to discuss this. He said, no, not every Jew. If you believe in the following 13, you have a share in the world to come. Maybe for another time. So, um, the very first Mishnah of hundreds of Mishnayim, hundreds of uh, teachings in Pirkei Avot, it says here, Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai. Moses received the Torah from Sinai. U misara le Yehoshua. And he gave it or handed it to Joshua. So we, we could continue, but this phrase, Moses received the Torah from Sinai and gave it over, U misara le Yehoshua. These are such pregnant words. There's so much to say about this. And we don't have a lot of time, but I'll just mention a couple of things. It says, again, Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai, Moses received the Torah from Sinai and gave it over to Yehoshua. So a lot of the commentators say, uh, why is this the best place to begin the study of ethics? Um, if I was the editor of the Pirkei Avot, Ethics of the Fathers, and somebody said, okay, write me some ethics. The first thing I would do, chapter one, teaching one, is teach you an ethic. <laughs> it's a book of ethics. Who needs this little preamble? Moses received the Torah from Sinai. He gave it to Joshua, gave it to this one, gave it to the elders, gave it to the men of the great assembly. Who needs to know about all of this? Teaching one ought to be a teaching. And this is not yet an ethical teaching. It's just a little bit of a historical background. And many of the commentators wonder who needs this? Why did this, why did this get put first before an actual teaching? So here's my take on it after looking at several commentaries about this question. So one commentary says, well, we need to know that the ethics that are going to be learned in the ethics of the fathers, Pirkei Avot, we need to know that this set of ethics, rules, morality, is different from all other ethics in the world. So, uh, I'm going to ask my good friend Avram, okay? Uh, if, just tell me the word that comes to your mind after I say one word, okay? Aristotle. Greek. Greek, very good. Uh, Plato. Not the Play-Doh that we play in. Plato. Philosophy. Philosophy. Greek philosophy. So some of the commentators say, you know why we needed this preamble? Moses gave the, God gave the Torah to Moshe. This is to make a very, very strong line of demarcation between divine ethics and ethics that may come from everywhere else. There's ethics from the Greeks, ethics from the Romans, ethics from other places. But we want the Jewish people to know, those who are studying the Pirkei Avot ethics of the fathers, the, the other ethics may be interesting. There are some great philosophers who based a lot of their things on uh, Aristotelian philosophy, Greek philosophy. But we want the people who are studying Pirkei Avot ethics of the fathers to know 
that the other stuff may be interesting, maybe even have some truth here and there, but what we're going to study in Ethics of the Fathers is compelling. Why? Because this is divine. Everything we're learning here comes from a divine source. So you want to dabble in the other stuff? All right, we could talk about it or not talk about it. But this stuff is divine. The origin is divine. And so that's why we begin with Moses received the Torah from Sinai. This is a divine, compelling piece of work. Everything you read here has a divine nature. If you were to ask me the question, what is the most important thing a Jew could be? What is the most important thing a Jew could be? I would say to you, a Kiddush Hashem, which means the most important thing a Jew could be is an example to the world of how God wants people to live and behave. And we call that in Hebrew a Kiddush Hashem, to be a pride, a pride to Hashem by the way we speak, the way we behave, the way we dress, the way we eat, the way we pray, etc. To me, that's the biggest goal of studying the Torah, learning, understanding, worshiping, etc., loving each other, being kind to each other. To me, that's the sum and essence of Judaism, is for a Jew, because of the Torah, to be a pride to Hashem, that people look at that individual and say, this is the way God wants people to be. Unfortunately, the opposite is called a Chilul Hashem, where people will look at Jewish behavior, a Jew, how they behave, speak, dress, etc., and say, this is what the Torah has taught them. This is what the Torah has taught them. So that's the opposite. So why do I mention this? Because I think when people understand the compelling divine nature of these laws, these teachings, they will understand that when people say about us, wow, this apple did not fall far from the tree. I don't know how many of you feel that sense of pride when people say about you, related to your parents, grandparents, when they say about you, wow, I see the apple has not fallen far from the tree. Uh, thank God I get that a lot about my parents. People say to me, I, wh whoever knows my parents, your, this apple did not fall far from the tree. I feel that to be a tremendous compliment, not just to me, but also to my parents and how they raised me, etc. So in the same way, I feel that when people say to Jews, wow, this Jew did not fall far from the tree. Which tree? The tree of life. They did not fall far from the tree of life, meaning what God has commanded, the divine nature of all the laws of the Torah, this person is an example of the best in the entire Torah. So why does it begin with Moses received the Torah from Sinai? These are all divine ways in which we can all, as Jewish people, uh, as good moral ethical people, these are all ways in which we can connect to God and have other people compliment us and say, wow, this is an example of how God would want us to live. So uh, I, I think, again, this is a, a very important idea that uh, Moses received the Torah from, from Sinai. And uh, I'll share with you a, a quick teaching from the Talmud. This is found in the tractate Yoma. Uh, and it says here, uh, I'll read it in the Hebrew and then translate. One who reads the Torah and studies it. And they internalize as much as they can the words of the wise, the words of the great sages. However, However, they don't behave in an appropriate ethical manner. So the Talmud says that a person who studies and a person who uh, tries to get to the depth of the Torah, and a person who goes to hear the wise as they lecture and give other kinds of lessons, but their behavior is not ethical. And this same individual who studies and listens and goes to many classes and lectures, but they don't behave in an ethical way, and their, their way of speaking to each other is not nice. What do people say about such a person? They say the following. 
Oy lo liploni shalama Torah. Woe to us that this person has studied the Torah. Oy lo la aviv shalimdo Torah. Woe to the father who has taught this person the Torah. Oy lo le rabo. Woe to the rabbi, the teacher, shalimdo Torah. Woe to all of the people that this person is connected. Because what do people say about him? Ploni shalama Torah. Ra'u kama mikul kalim ma'asav. This individual who has studied the Torah and gone to Torah lectures and still doesn't behave appropriately, doesn't speak in a nice manner. This person who studied Torah, look how mikul kalim, look how um, terrible, look how, I'll get the right word in a second, how terrible are his ways. Look how he has twisted what he knows and look how it comes out. The kama mechu'arin durachav. This word I know. How ugly are his ways. So here is the Talmud telling us that an individual who goes to lectures, uh, goes to the synagogue on a regular basis, an individual who uh, goes on websites, uh, listens to different uh, classes, studies the Torah in depth, but it hasn't really affected their inner personality, their inner character, because they don't speak nicely, they don't behave properly, and they literally, mikul kalin, ruin. Look how he ruins the Torah. So, uh, again, the divinity of the Torah, the divinity of what is given to Moses, who passes it on to Joshua, is of a compelling nature, very different than Greek philosophy that people may be more familiar with. And through the study of Pirkei Avot, every Jew can be a Kiddush Hashem. Every Jew can be a shining example, uh, a shining reflection of God, where people say about this person, wow, boy, is this person connected. Boy, is this person not falling far from the tree. Which tree? The tree of life. This individual has gotten it right. And Hashem, God, must be so proud of this person that it's unbelievable. So uh, now we come to this word, Moshe Kibel Torah, Mi Sinai. Moses received the Torah from Sinai. That's interesting. Um, if I were to ask the people here, uh, would you um, perhaps word it differently? So I'll start it off. Moses received the Torah from, what would you say? Hashem. Hashem received it from God. What would you say? From Hashem. From Hashem. To a, uh, that's pretty good. I'm on a roll here. <laughs> what would you say? Moses received the Torah from? Hashem. Hashem. Wow. See, that's what I would say. Moses, <laughs> Moses received the Torah from Hashem. And why does it say Moses received the Torah Misenai? From or at the mountain of Sinai. So here's what we hear from some of the commentaries. What was Sinai? What was the mountain of Sinai? According to our tradition, was it the Himalaya of its time? Was it the hugest mountain of its time? According to our Midrashic teaching, it was the lowliest mountain. And according to our teachings, that lowest of all the mountains in the range in Sinai was exactly the one that God, Hashem, chose upon which to give his Torah. What's the point of saying God gave, Moses received the Torah from Sinai, from at Sinai and not from Hashem, not from God? Perhaps it's to teach us the lesson of humility. The lesson of humility. So, to sum that idea up, and we'll say a little bit more, here is God giving the Torah on the most humble mountain through the most humble of all of his servants, namely Moses. And I would say to you today, and I'm going to say a little bit more about this, that the Torah can only be learned through humility. 
If you think great about yourself, you think you're perfect without learning anything else in the world, there's really not a chance you're going to absorb the teachings of the Torah. Um, if you think you're just perfect, if you think you know it all, anybody know people like that? People who know it all, got it all, can't teach them a thing. You teach them something, oh, I knew that. I, I knew that. Well, you think you're telling me something I didn't know? By saying that Moses received the Torah from Sinai, the most humble of the mountain mountains, is to say that the Torah can only be received from, from humility. When you are humble, when you know about yourself that there's more to learn, more to do, more to observe, absorb, more to buff and polish. If you know that about yourself, then you are open to the lessons and the teachings of the Torah. If you are closed, you're done, you're arrogant, you've got nothing more to learn, the Torah is going to do little or nothing for you. So uh, I remember during my rabbinic career, people asked me many questions that kept on coming up over and over and over again. Uh, Rabbi, if you have a tattoo, can you be buried in your cemetery? I heard that if not a hundred times, a thousand times. Uh, this is, of course, all from living people, which is good. <laughs> so that question kept on coming up over and over again. There are many others. We don't have time. Anyway, yes, you can be buried in your cemetery, even with a tattoo. But another question kept on coming up, especially Shabbat morning. Rabbi, where does the custom come from pointing a, uh, your pinky at the Torah as it's being uh, passed around through the congregation? I don't know if you've noticed this in your particular congregation or wherever you pray or daven. There's a custom to point our pinky when we see the Torah and to point to it uh, as it's being carried around and then to some people kiss their pinky. But uh, I heard this question 500 times, which is not a problem, except it was from the same person. That's already, <laughs> that's already a little annoying. Aver. Yeah, it's a little annoying, but what can I tell you? Anyway, so, uh, you know, I researched this. I looked, I looked at several different books that talked about ritual, etc. Uh, I may have been looking at the wrong ones. Mad Magazine contained none of this information. <laughs> okay. I looked at many different sources, couldn't find the idea of pointing a pinky. So in the absence of finding anything, this is what I told people, and it rested well on their ears. I said, here's my take on it. Pinky, forget the thumb for a moment, because then the same person will, oh, what about the thumb? The pinky, in general, is the smallest of all the fingers. And maybe what we're saying is we understand the lesson that this Torah, is only going to be learned, absorbed, taken in if we are humble, tiny, like the pinky. Arrogant, nothing is going to come in. We don't need it. We don't want it. We're perfect just the way we are. But if we're humble, small, tiny, like the pinky, then I think we have a great chance at being able to absorb the teachings of the Torah. So what does it mean to be humble? I, I found uh, uh, something on my Facebook feed uh, which said the following. You might have heard it yourself. Humility is not to think less of yourself, but to think of yourself less. That's a good one. Not to think less of yourself as much as to think of yourself less. I found the following on, uh, on my Facebook feed today. It said... One day they'll dig to the center of the universe and many will be surprised it's not them. <laughs> so we can say a whole lot more about humility. I will tell you three quick ways to be more humble than perhaps we are right now. It doesn't involve a whole lot. It may be things that we're doing already. One way, every time I make a commitment to do something, say something, be somewhere, whatever, 99% of the time I don't fail to say to Hashem. God willing. Rabbi, can you make it tomorrow at four? Let me look at my calendar. I'm free. I'm open. God willing, I'll see you tomorrow at four. I think I'm at about 99%. What does God willing have to do with humility? It means to say it's not all in my hands. If God wills it, I'll be there at four. Another example, very similar to the idea of Mirza Hashem. If God wills it, I'll be there at 4.30. Another one is Bli Neder. 
is that we make a commitment to something and we say right away without making a vow or a promise. It's another way of saying we know we're, we know we're not the ultimate boss of our time. There is another boss of our time who's bigger than we are. And if that bigger boss, God, wills it, then I'll be there at four o'clock. And the third quick way, and again, many of us may already do this, is to make a blessing before we eat food. Uh, different kinds of blessings. We don't have time to get much into this right now, but before we eat an apple, before we eat a slice of bread, etc., other kinds of things, drink all kinds of drinks, there are blessings appropriate before we eat. What's that got to do with humility? It's a way of saying, I know that what I'm eating had a divine origin. Is that the biggest thing we can do for humility? Maybe at another time. These, are, I think, are quick, easy ways to acknowledge the fact that we are not the all and end all in the world and that there is a God, there is Hashem, who is watching, supervising, and helping us along throughout the day. And the more we recognize him, the more spiritual we become. So uh, I, I guess I have time for maybe another, uh, another quick part of this teaching. And it says here, Moshe kibel Torah Sinai. Moses received the Torah from Sinai. U misara le Yehoshua. And he, here in my translation, says he handed it down to Joshua. U misara le Yehoshua. Now, here you kind of have to be a linguist, but you may know a lot of Hebrew. Again, if somebody said to me, edit this piece, U misara means handed it over. I would have gone for an easier Hebrew word. Easier Hebrew word. And the Hebrew word I would have used is unetana, latate, to give over. Tangli, slicha, uh, pardon me, do you have a cup of water? Okay, yes I do. Bebakasha, tangli. You wouldn't say bebakasha, misorli. You wouldn't say please, uh, in the Hebrew word, hand it over. Latate, to give. Uh, a, a student drops a, a, a pencil on their way in, and you don't know whose it is, and uh, you say, by the way, does this belong to anybody? Somebody in the back row, yes, that's my pencil. You say to somebody in the, fir in the first row, Bevakasha, please, la la, please give it to that person. You wouldn't say necessarily, please, misor, misor, hand it over to her. In English, it sounds the same, I know. But in Hebrew, la means to give, limsor means to hand over. The it's a whole different connotation. Moses gave it over to Joshua means to say that he understood, Moshe, Moses understood that he had very precious cargo in his hands. It wasn't just a, here, take it. Joshua, here, take the Torah, take the teachings. I'm going to give it to you, take it. Umisara is the difference between giving somebody a pen to use, and giving somebody a baby to hold. Giving somebody a pen to use is latate, to give the pen. Giving somebody a baby to hold for a moment while you have to go somewhere, why might more use the word limsor? Limsor, to give over. Limsor means there's a, there's a lovingness about it. Limsor means that you understand the preciousness of it. And so when the Pirkabot says, Umisarala Yoshua, he gave it over to Yehoshua, it, it's not a light, casual, here, Joshua, here's the tradition, take it. It's not a take it. It's, I've got something very precious, very sweet, very divine, and I want to give it over to you, Umisara. By the way, today, we call our tradition the Mesora. Uh, the, the art scroll people who publish have a line called the Misora, means this is the tradition handed down to us today. And it comes from the word Limsora. Misora means to hand it over lovingly, uh, to give it over with a sense of deep responsibility, uh, uh, deep affection. And again, you know you're, you're holding precious cargo that you want to give over. So when I was at Yeshiva University years ago, <laughs> Um, I had a, a great privilege of being uh, an assistant, but not a scholastic assistant, just a 
somebody who was with Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik of blessed memory every day for a few hours while he was teaching at Yeshiva University three days a week. And I did this for two hours, uh, not two, a few hours a day for two years. Uh, one time, uh, there were a group of students in my high school dormitory. I ran the high school dormitory, about 90 students every year at Yeshiva University, the high school. One year, we had about four or five students who lived in the high school dormitory. Uh, how do I describe them? Hmm. The, the word that would be used in Yiddish is a tzatzke. I don't know if you're familiar with that word. Real treasures. <laughs> so you have to say treasures with a, like, a fakrum tapana. They were real. Wow. It really took everything to ask these five not to leave the door. They were not the best influence. I think overall, we all had some influence on them. Anyway, I took these five boys who didn't study too well. They weren't really thinking on the same page as everybody else, if you know what I mean. And I said to them, how would you like to meet Rabbi Soloveitchik? And they said, oh, he lives in the next building, right? Whenever he walks in the street, there are a lot of people around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How would you like to meet him and ask him for a few questions if you have any questions? And boy, did they have questions about all kinds of Jewish things. And they, wow, we would love that. So I arranged a meeting some night, 7.30, brought in the five boys. And I remember saying to myself, dear Hashem, please, I hope that Rav Soloveitchik does not ask these boys to leave after two minutes. I hope they don't throw around the, the cushions. These boys, this is, could have been the, the worst disaster. Anyway, they all sat down very nicely. And every time they referred to the rabbis that they were studying, like in their Talmud class, they would call, they would call them those guys. So what are you studying in Talmud? One of them would say, oh, we're studying about where those guys taught. And every time they referred to rabbis, either the rabbis that were teaching in the rooms at the high school or rabbis, uh, sages that they were, uh, remember learning about, they would always call them those guys. And Rabbi Soloveitchik at some point asked them to pause and he said, pardon me, I just would like to ask you a favor. Please don't call them those guys. And one of the boys said, okay, what would you like us to call them? And he said, please call them Chachme Hamisora. What is that? Please call them the sages of our Mesorah. Please call them the sages of our handed down tradition. And that's exactly the same word that is used in the Mishnah here. Moshe received the Torah from Sinai as an example of humility, and he lovingly handed it over to Joshua, who then lovingly understanding the critical nature of handing it over lovingly, gave it over to the others. And they, down through the history of the Jewish people, down through a chain of transmission, call them, please, Chachmei HaMesora, the sages of our transmission. And I think that's the difference between just giving something over and lovingly passing something down to the next generation. So, um, I can say there's a lot more to say, and um, perhaps this is a good place to, is that all right, a good place to stop. And if by any chance we uh, meet another time, I'll be very happy to continue. Uh, maybe, I, can I add one more thing, one more thing? So, in the Pirkei Avot, there's a, we often find this phrase, uh, this rabbi, this rabbi, this rabbi, this rabbi would say, and in Hebrew, it would say the phrase, Hu haya omer. Rabbi Akiva, blah, blah, blah. Hu haya omer. He would say the following. And you find this phrase very often in Pir Kabot and in other places too, but here especially, this one, this one, this one. Hu haya omer, he would say. Uh, there's a great uh, rabbi who was known as the rabbi of Kaidanov. Thank you for not asking me a whole lot about him. I found his name, and I thought what he had to say was very interesting. He says 
that, uh, for example, one of the teachings we didn't get to today was the teachings of uh, Shimon HaTzadik, who is buried here in Jerusalem. There's a whole train stop uh, named for him, and greater things have been done in the name of Shimon HaTzadik. Uh, but uh, on this phrase, Shimon HaTzadik, the great righteous Shimon, who Haya Omer, he used to say. So uh, the Rebbe of Rabbi Aaron of Kaidanov used to say, what does it mean to say who Haya Omer? He would say, the teaching was who Haya, the teacher would be the teaching, and then Omer, he would say it. What does that mean? It means to say that when we talk about the great sages, whenever they said something, they first became the teaching that they were going to teach. If they were going to teach about humility, they first had to become humble themselves and be the paragons of humility. Once they became that, they would say the following. This great righteous person, Hu Haya Omer, he would first be the paragon, the exemplar of being righteous, and only after that, Omer, he would say what he would say. So I thought it was a very interesting teaching. It, it in a sense, tells us that all the sages that we read about in Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the fathers, I don't know about who Rabbi Aaron of Kaidanov said this specifically. I just found this commentary on Shimon Atzadik. It could apply to all that are quoted in the in the ethics of the fathers Pirkei Avot. But again, I think I think the lesson is so beautiful. Uh, as teachers, I'm a rabbi. I'm a teacher. As a teacher. I would hesitate to teach anything that I didn't live myself. I would hesitate to teach anything that I didn't feel I first absorbed myself, could be an example of, because then if I taught that, but I was an example of it, uh, what's the word? Begins with a hip. Hypocrite. Hypocrite. So these are like very, very pure teachings. These are, uh, there's no hypocrite. Bar Hashem, thank God, amongst the crowd. Who Haya, each person was the paragon of their teaching. And then Omer, then that person would feel comfortable enough to teach it to others. Only after he became the exemplar of that value, that ethic, that sense of morality that he was going to teach. So, great to be with everybody today at the Amuna Center. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it very much. And uh, not sure where you're going to hear this, but looking forward to the next time. Shalom, everybody. <laughs>